Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just waiting a few more seconds for a few more people to join this webinar. Um, so just hang in there and wait a little bit. Welcome to Nordregio, by the way. We're uh, sending this webinar today from uh, live from Stockholm, from Nordregio at Trepsholme in the middle of the city. And it's actually snowing outside. Uh, we're hoping that you're doing fine, that you had a good start of the year, uh, despite COVID and everything. Um, so we really want to welcome you to this third session in our series about localizing the Agenda 2030 and taking the SDGs to the local level. Um, and the topic for today is planning for equal rights. Uh, so integrating gender and youth perspectives into your SDG work. Um, our focus today is on the municipalities, towns and cities across the Nordic countries and your work with the SDGs. Um, my name is Osa Ström Hildestrand and I'm head of communications here at Nordregio. And with me today to host and lead the discussion, I have Diana Wynn and uh, Natalia Mon Montan, who will uh, run the program. Um, and of course, we want to hear from you. Uh, in the best of worlds, this wouldn't have been a webinar. It would have been a nice workshop where we could all have shared our experiences. So please don't be shy, use the chat function. Uh, and also please respond to our multi questions that will come up soon. Diana will present them in a little bit. All right, uh, I shouldn't make a very lengthy introduction. Uh, basically just say that we all know that the Nordic countries are champions when it comes to gender and inclusion, uh, but we also have things left to do. We talk about sexual harassment, gender-based violence, honor-related crimes, a very segregated, gender-segregated labor market, and also a toxic masculinity in certain ways. Um, and we need to do more to include youth in decision-making and to work with our minority groups and the LGBTI community. So there are things to do, and there are a lot of actors and municipalities out there that do a lot of inspiring things. So today we will hear from three uh, true front runners on gender and youth inclusion. We'll listen to Arendal in Norway, We'll hear from Umeå in Sweden, and we will travel all the way to Koppa Vågur in Iceland. We're very happy to have you all here. Um, and first of all, we'll have a um, colleague from Nick, Nordic Information on Gender, to talk about the Nordic Gender Equality Fund, which in act can actually fund some of your new projects and initiatives on gender. And last but not least, we'll visit Österbotten in Finland, a regional front runner supporting the municipalities to do more on gender. So full program, uh, but now over to you, Diana, and let's hear more about Menti and our other things in the program. Uh, yes, thank you, Osa. I will uh, begin just very quickly with the housekeeping that uh, Osa mentioned just now. Is it on full? No. There. There you go. Okay. So uh, the chat function is open and uh, we invite you to uh, interact and ask as many questions as you feel like, uh, uh, even before, during and after the presentations. And uh, we will have many questions um, throughout the webinar. So uh, please note the code now. Uh, um, Natalia will also share this in the in the chat shortly. So um, um, yeah, just uh, give us a little shout if you can't enter the Menti uh, Menti questions. But um, um, just as a prelude to our day's program, which also just um, outlined, uh, just uh, wanted to. Um, 
uh, kind of um, start off um, talking very generally about why we're focusing on this topic today and uh, um, stressing um, the fact that we are focusing on both um, the fifth and uh, SDG on uh, uh, ensuring uh, gender equality and empower all girls and women and um, combined with the 10th the SDG, which is reducing inequalities within and between um, countries invariably because these two connect. And while the focus today will be on um, the practices uh, within the Nordic region, it is um, important to keep in mind that we also, you know, these, these are um, uh, global uh, challenges that, that uh, we are also addressing. And um, uh, it occurred to me that uh, um, uh, these SDGs are also something that we're um, having to grapple with now during, during this pandemic. Uh, I won't um, go into detail, but um, that's kind of just like keeping this global perspective while we hone in on the, on the work and efforts that have been um, done in the Nordic countries. Because even before the, the SDG and Agenda 2030 framework was adopted, uh, the Nordic countries have long been a, a front runner. I think it has been for nearly four decades also, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so we have already uh, kind of been taking the lead um, before, before the SDGs um, uh, were adopted. So if anything, uh, the initiatives are, are complementing the past, present, and um, uh, coming uh, initiatives that we will, um, the, the Nordic region will focus on. Uh, and um, in the Nordic vision, there are three um, focus areas, and one of them is on social sustain sustainability, under which gender equality and inclusion um, fall under. And as, uh, among the um, Nordic Council of Minister Institution, there are a range of initiatives, activities uh, that work toward fulfilling the cooperation program on gender equality, including involvement of, of uh, youth and LGBTQ issues, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is also um, um, uh, presented in the uh, Nordic indicator for the uh, Vision 2030, uh, where the focus has been on gender segregated labor market, father share parental leave, proportion of women in national parliaments. However, uh, it is also important to acknowledge, and the cooperation program uh, do mention this, that uh, while the region is one of the uh, most gender equal regions, uh, there are still a lot of challenges uh, that, uh, that remain and that uh, the Me Too movement are indicative of these issues regarding gender discrimination, societal structure and power dynamics uh, are uh, now very central to our public debate and discourse. Um, similarly, I'll, uh, the same for SDG, 10, um, their indicators there, and I encourage you to, to go look at these uh, after the program today to see how these uh, complement and substantiate the, the work that the uh, Nordic region uh, do on, the, on fulfilling the, the targets of the two SDGs. And then lastly, I wanted to turn, um, uh, draw some attention to the uh, European Charter for Equality. Uh, that was also written uh, many years ago, I think it was in 2006, that focuses specifically on localizing gender equality in Europe, which is what we're doing today. Um, and just to wrap it up then, um, if we are to achieve a society based on equality, it is essential that local and regional governments take the gender dimensions fully into account in their policies, their organization and practices. Um, uh, which is why I am really looking forward to hear from our presenters today, because uh, this is exactly what we're doing. <laughs> so, uh, also, yeah. I'll hand it over to you again. Thank you so much for that introduction to the SDGs 5 and 10, which are the main topics for today's webinar. And I also, of course, want to emphasize that we're doing this in a very close collaboration with the Nordic Council of Ministers. And it's, it's an extension of an ongoing program on 
Nordic support to municipalities on gender. And now our first guest speaker today is Jemny Pentler, project coordinator at NIC, Nordic Information on Gender Equality. And you happen to, to uh, be the, the office, the, the institution under the Nordic collaboration on gender. So please tell us a little bit more about the policies behind here and specifically about the Gender Equality Fund and your new call for projects. Very welcome, Jenny. Thank you very much. Um, so happy to take part today in this interesting seminar. Uh, let me see if I can share the screen. I'm sure you can. <laughs> so my name is, uh, let me see if this works. Yes. Yeah, um, that looks good. Yeah, looks okay. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jenny Pantler. I'm more the coordinator, project coordinator at NIC, Nordic Information and and gender and we are as also already stated are a cooperation body under the nordic council of ministers for gender equality uh, we uh, contribute to achieving the goals of the nordic cooperation program for gender equality by collecting and strategically disseminating research politics knowledge and practice from a nordic and cross-sectoral uh, perspective we also administer the Nordic Gender Equality Fund on behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And today uh, I will talk a little bit about the possibilities of this Nordic Gender Equality Fund and some results from the projects of uh, municipalities uh, across the Nordic region. Uh, first, just a few political uh, framework. Um, aspects. Um, the Nordic prime ministers have uh, stated that gender equality is a prerequisite for the sustainable development of the Nordic region. And also they, uh, they stress the not alone, not only the standalone uh, objective of, of gender equality, but that it's also a cross sectoral perspective that should be influencing everything um, within the sustainable development goals. And to look more closely uh, at what we're doing, uh, the political framework in the Nordic region, we have the Nordic Cooperation Programme on Gender Equality for the period of 2019 and 22. Here we have four priorities, uh, the future work and economic growth. Um, this priority looks at gender segregated labor market and also how we can share the, uh, the uh, domestic, uh, share the unpaid work uh, for the home and, and, and share responsibilities for children and so on. And we have a link here with the, the SDG of uh, number eight, decent work and economic growth. We also link to the, um, the goal three uh, of good health and well-being by looking at welfare and health and equality of life with equal access to health for both men and women and also um, the counteracting of uh, sexual harassment, violence and gender-based violence and, and violations. Um, the third priority looks at power and, and influence. Here we look at uh, equality in leadership, uh, for example. And uh, the fourth priority looks at gender equality with focus on men and masculinities. And here we look at the inclusion of, of men and boys in, in gender equality actions and um, looking at uh, norms and stereotypes that might be uh, limiting. Just to, to present your mode instead to full screen mode for your slides. Yes. So okay. It's not looking very good. Uh, uh, Can you do that? It looks. Yes. Uh, if it's really good. Yeah. Ah, better. <laughs> Yay. Very good. Thank you. Sorry. Finally. Please Thank you. <laughs> um, the Nordic Gender Equality Fund 
supports cooperation within these areas that I just mentioned in the cooperation program. And here uh, we have uh, uh, annual calls for proposals where applications from uh, three organizations from minimum of three Nordic or Baltic uh, countries uh, are welcome. Uh, we hope that uh, these projects should lead to contribute to new knowledge, exchange of experience, and, and just strengthen Nordic infrastructure and networks. The projects that are funded uh, can be uh, running for up to two years, uh, and the funding that uh, they can apply for is between 50,000 Danish kronor uh, to 500,000 Danish kronor. And the projects need to, to contribute 20% of the project budget themselves. And organizations that can apply include, of course, municipalities and regions, uh, other public authorities, research institutes, universities, NGOs, uh, voluntary organizations, and also SMEs. So after having said a little bit about what can be done, we're also going to look at the next call when you can apply. And this will be launched this spring. We will have a digital information meeting ahead of the call, and then it will open the 1st of March and close. The deadline is the 31st of March. We hope to assess and evaluate the proposals to be ready to decide on which projects should receive funding in May. And then we contract the projects and activities can start in from the summer and onwards. Sounds very exciting. How, how many years have you been doing this now? We have had the, the fund since 2013 and we have funded 67 projects so far. Uh, so, so probably many of our audience members have also been part of this, but if you haven't and if you want to try again, uh, don't miss the opportunity and find your, your peers uh, just so you make sure to be at least three Nordic countries involved, right? That's the, that's the important requirement here the minimum requirement. You can be several if you want to. And, uh, and of course, it's good to have a cross-sectoral uh, approach from the whole Nordic region. Right. right. So that was a little bit about the, the, the basics of the fund. Uh, we can look at the results of some of the projects that we have funded. Um, there are two projects that I'm going to want to tell you a little bit about. First, we have the Enhanced Labour Market Opportunities for Immigrant Women, uh, where Nordrega was one of the uh, um, partners, when, but also the municipalities of Akureyri in Iceland, Luleå in Sweden, and Rovaniemi in Finland uh, took part. Uh, we're looking at how to include immigrant women in the local labour market. This project uh, um, noticed the importance of language skills and uh, also the, the difficulties uh, it was for the, the problems with uh, providing uh, language courses um, and the importance of actually accessing these courses for these immigrant women. And one of the possibilities to improve this is to um, organize uh, language skills courses for only for women and also for women in the same educational background. So it, it's more productive. Mm. And on these local uh, labor market, uh, it's also quite open, quite important to have um, a social network. And these immigrant women were lacking that. Mm. So one of the aspects that can be developed, they noticed was uh, local mentors and matchmaking initiatives. Uh, so the, to sort of open up the labor market and match the, the, the employers with the possible um, labor force of, of these uh, women. We also have another project uh, which we're dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace, in the health sector. Here we have Accurate again. Uh, but Arendal in Norway and Eskilstuna in Sweden, who, which together with the University of Agder in Norway, um, looked at uh, sexual harassment, uh, which is quite common in the health sector. Uh, they created a network for method development and uh, noticed that uh, there were, although there might be measures in place for um, how to deal with sexual harassment, there was no 
guidelines in specific to the, the health sector and also no guidelines in relation to to the aspect that was actually the most frequent when when young women were um, offended by patients or relatives of patients so by noticing all this in this study, they also developed guidelines how the, the method to deal and to prevent and manage sexual harassment in the health sector uh, can be deal, dealt with. And as an additional aspect, they actually managed also to develop a course on sexual harassment in the health, in the health sector. So this, this course has been running now in Norway and Iceland and over 800 participants has been taking uh, part. So uh, right. well, sounds very part. relevant. Yes. So uh, addressing two super important issues here uh, mm -hmm. that we all have to to struggle with, I think, or to work harder on. Uh, sorry. Yes, you probably have a final slide here as well. No. Well, um, that was um, what I was gonna say. And if any of you are interested in in more information about these projects or in the call, you're of course uh, very welcome to contact me or or look at our website and also subscribe to our e our newsletters so that you can keep up to date with the, the coming call and, and all the information that we might have of interest for you. That's super. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I'm going to turn now to Diana to see, do we have any questions in the chat here? Uh, yes. Any specifics to, to Jenny? Um, no, there haven't been any. So then I think we can jump uh, right on to our first. Yeah, to the Menti. Question. But I also then want to say that, right. again, don't You're be shy to contact Jenny if you want to know more about the call and also then when we hear from, uh, start talking to the municipalities soon, don't be shy and please ask your questions in the chat. But now over to you and the Menti. Yes, so has everyone been able to log on to the Menti? I uh, assume so, so I'll just go ahead. Our first question is for how long has your municipality or organization worked with SDG 5? Uh, and 10 or related gender equality issues. Right, okay, interesting. So it looks like we have a lot of um, initiatives started after the Agenda 2030 might have been adopted. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's a coincidental timing or um, not unexpected, there are a host of institutions who've been doing this for decades. Yeah, let's see if we have some more responses. And uh, hope it works for everyone. If you're using yes. your telephones, perhaps on the side, or if you just. Yeah, it's very easy to use on your mobile phone if you just log on to your browser. It's what I'm doing myself. Well, this is funny that if it's now totally divided between the different faces, so we can't generalize. There is a perfect mix uh, within the audience, although, of course, not the full audience is, uh, is responding. We have up to 20 responses right now. Um, but it seems like maybe a few uh, actually have, have started sooner uh, rather than than earlier uh, so so uh, but let's see this is this is uh, at least an indication that many have also worked on this for a longer time uh, but quite a few maybe more more than i expected have started pretty recently and now we're trying to also combine sdg 5 and 10 throughout the program today because gender equality is just one of the targets obviously of your inclusion work all right, thank you so much. So we have one more Menti question while we're at it. Yes, Natalia, I think then we'll thank you for your answers. And the next one, we'll just kind of jump straight on to you, uh, is that we would like to know what areas you have worked with. And you can choose multiple um, answers here as well. So, are the areas you have worked with um, about LGBTQ and our youth inclusion, gender-based violence and sexual harassment, gender-segregated labor market, integration of immigrant women, discrimination on different grounds, or other issues? Of course, 
this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives us an indication of some of the central issues that have been focused, uh, that's been the focus here in the Nordic region. There are quite a few answers coming in. And we have a pretty clear distribution here on some issues. <laughs> Gender-based violence and sexual harassment, surprisingly, perhaps not as high as we'd expect. Yeah, this is quite uh, quite interesting. I thought that was a uh, very sort of top of the list uh, intervention right now, but uh, the LGBTQ issues have also been on the agenda for quite a while in the Nordics and together with youth inclusion seems to be the most important or most commonly uh, used or biggest focus area in your inclusion work. Mm. Um, so thank you for, for contributing your, your answers and giving us a better idea of, of what you're working on. Uh, absolutely. And the labor market segregation was also high on the list there. And it's really a persistent challenge. And uh, maybe that's also something where you could apply for, for uh, funds from, from Nick uh, and uh, further your work. Thank you so much. Uh, we've come to, uh, to uh, the next phase in our program here, where we start uh, listening to our front runner municipalities. Uh, and I'll just remind you again, uh, ask your questions in the chat function as we move along. And first uh, of our municipalities, uh, we would like to hear or welcome you to Arendal and Lisbeth Iversen. Uh, you are the chief manager or leader of the Med Hjerte for Arendal, uh, with a heart for Arendal program or network activity, which is all about localizing the SDGs in practice through relation building, through uh, really utilizing all your inhabitants as assets for community development. And you have said that the SDGs are a great source, a great tool for inclusion because they're global. So both old and new Arendal inhabitants can really relate to them and you can look forward and build together. Uh, that's wonderful. Lisbeth, you have a lot to tell us about. So please get started. Yes, um, I will uh, share my presentation. Um, let's see, can you see it or? Yes, yes, you could just uh, just use the the full screen mode. Yeah, perfect. Is it Thank okay you. now? Perfect. Uh, and how do I just I just click on it then I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for the invitation. I think it's very useful and uh, very uh, inspiring to work across the Nordic cities and countries. We need to learn from each other and share information. Um, in Arendal, we have tried to be both global and local. And to the right, you see our newest product, uh, the process towards a new municipal plan, society plan, based on uh, the UN SDGs. And we have tried to find the right words for what does these goals uh, mean for us in Arendal. And as you see on the front page, page the, the girls and women and also, of course, gender equality is very important. We work on innovation and resource-based development. We say we work for and with citizens to make Arendal an even better place uh, to live for everybody. And that will be a long walk um, and a dialogue and not a talk. I think it's important to say this is an ongoing work. To the right, I just saw, show a picture of uh, a report on all the things we did together. And if somebody is interested, I will send you a link. It's in Norwegian, but anyway, to say that it's hard work. It's hard everyday work and, and we need to stay in it. So creating engagement through this pentahelic approach is a kind of what we call the Arendal method. But I think a lot of you are doing the same 
It's, but it's always relevant to ask who have we invited on board? Who are we informing? Do we have the different sectors, researchers, you know, the citizens? And, and we try to do this in a co-creation approach using placemaking. I will say a little bit about that. Have a, a highlight the inclusion perspective and do a lot of experimentation in order for you know, us to be able to do capacity building so we can learn more and try more and uh, have better results. So this is just a little overview again of, of the methods and especially also asset-based community development where we look at what do we have here? What can we manage ourselves? Who can get involved? Who knows something? And we look for challenges sometimes and we need to know what is not working, but we will highlight possibilities. People want to be on a winning team. They want to have a future. So please uh, remember to invite people to make better uh, solutions for their everyday life and for the future. So of course, cultural resources, artists have been very important in our work to be a little playful, but also to challenge the existing ways of planning and doing things so we can have a more place-led uh, development. And then before I get lost in my presentation, which I normally do, uh, but I will keep my timing here. So uh, share responsibility and power in the process. That's an experience from Arendal. And the politicians said that four out of eight places in the steering committee of this two year long process was actually given to the people. So to, to actually uh, give uh, power to the people for real is very important. Then to have a holistic approach, look at your whole municipality, the broad participation. What we did address from the beginning was, was to search for the silent voices, search for the invisible, the people who do not write in the paper or come to the, the public meetings. And then as uh, you introduced the, in the beginning, we saw that the UN SDGs gave room to a more open and a broader kind of belonging. Uh, also newcomers could deal with, you know, what it means to have equity and they have uh, experience from their own countries and they can bring it to the local place, Arendal. Then we have a focus on linking top down like this planning uh, process that needs to be done according to the planning law, but also the initiatives of people according to, to the planning law, that, that needs to be addressed and worked with, and we need to be in this between. We used both social and digital meeting places and information was sent out in different ways and also papers on the local shops. So you can see that if you want to participate now to say something, do it here or there. And take time, build trust, be relevant and concrete. So when I'm stopped, I hope at least you remember these very important points. And then I think we have been very uh, concerned with collecting people's dreams and asks for needs. So we have been asking people for many years, uh, and I will show you also one way of doing that, how we can be relevant. What uh, do they need in the everyday life? So I think we need to solve uh, the small challenges that they can be big. Uh, but, uh, you know, transport for el elderly in the city center, activities for children in public places, develop a transport to activity app for newcomers and refugees. How do they get to, uh, you know, a training center or some activity? And we need to act, play, work together, test and try a little harder. And here you see a frame that has been going around on festivals and meetings and in the summer uh, carried by young people asking the inhabitants about the dreams. So serving leadership as a principle translated to an everyday language is get out. Get out of your office, ask people and keep asking. And establish long-term collaboration. So to the right here, you see uh, the front page of the decision, the platform for collaboration in Arendal, which is a, a local council decision, but it was co-created uh, in two years. How are we supposed to behave 
work together, respect each other, and start uh, the plan, the municipal plan. So it, this was even um, landed before the start of the planning process. And then we have these small everyday or every month tools. We actually are some people who invite people to meet for the first time. I have mentioned this before. There's no agenda. It's just get to know another person in your city. And it's not happening automatically. So we need to help people a little bit. Then I don't have a lot of time to talk about what we have in bottom here, but we are also working with the terms placemaking for peacemaking, how we can actually foster an inclusive uh, public space strategy and promote peacemaking in cities and in, in parts of our municipality. And you can read a little bit more about it, but it has to do with involvement of people to ask them to, to ask people who live in a place to involve them and also make them take the lead of processes. Uh, and the place, what is a place? It's a physical place, but it's also a democratic space, relational aspects. We need to address how do we talk to each other? Who is included here? This is our mayor talking to the people. Seems that he, he wants to bring politics out in the everyday life. So I think it's a beautiful image actually. Um, and then we need to be very concrete, provide universal access uh, to inclusive and accessible public places, you know, green places. But we have also said, especially for women and children and persons with disabilities. So I think sometimes we, when we say all, we maybe need to have projects for se uh, several groups and be specific. Who, uh, who needs something more and who do we need to address? So just a few examples from our everyday laboratory, because we do try to take the goals down to action and get involved Arendal is a collaboration to have a safer, more attractive and inclusive city. And of course, we want more people to use the city and that it should be attractive to more people. And we want restaurants to take a clear, clan, uh, clear stand uh, on illegal drugs. Uh, uh, people working in restaurants, police, volunteers, have, many hundred have taken courses on how to behave uh, around drugs and the people who are on drugs to be kind, but to be, be clear that they cannot enter the restaurant and so on. And we have engaged people and organization and uh, joined the Nordic Safe Cities to share and learn. We do not know everything. Uh, you are many cities out there who can help us. And here you see just some of the project group because the police, the restaurant owner, the municipality, NGOs, voluntary organizations, we actually need to sit down at the same, ta same table and get involved practically. How, this is a walk. What does it look like? And we also have evening and night walks. Um, and, they, and then out of uh, the work the last five, six years, together with uh, addressing the SDGs, we see that young people, especially young people with refugee background and also from families with challenges, they, they kind of make some noise in the city. And sometimes uh, they, they get in touch with the police. And when we started working with the young, especially the young guys in the beginning, uh, they really wanted to conquer the public places. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to have a role uh, in the city. They wanted to have action, street basket, and they developed urban young. And this has become a very strong movement. And these young guys and some girls now were hired to work in the city during the COVID-19 in this summer to make it safe and arrange uh, activities for children in all the public places. So it's really interesting to see how then criminality went down this summer because the young people conquered the, the public places. And another project uh, where we address the youth, uh, we collaborated with the, the public private sector project and also cultural actors and we have uh, developed a new cultural center, especially addressing youth, but also 
for other people to, to take part. And it's really centralized in the city center and has all kinds of facilities and infrastructure. And yet we thought, but what about the people, the young girls and guys who will be here? And the girls had told us through the process, it's not so easy to be a girl and a refugee background girl in Arendal. So we have started now, we got funded for a new project and we start now in February with the project Girls in our city. So this is just to say a little bit about how important it is to try to be on two levels, the overall goals and still with your feet on the streets. Uh, just a few summing up points, you know, we need to have good information when we want to start dialogues and or we need to listen to what comes in, in our email or maybe people are addressing something in the newspaper and take time to build trust to anchor the projects and discuss the goals so that we kind of feel we own it. Uh, and I think uh, to get action started and be very concrete and specific is very important and have fun and experiment. I think that is my main measures. And then of course, context matters. So tailor-made approaches are important, I think in all cities and parts of the cities. So we have to take the world down to the street and, and bring the solutions of the streets out to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisbeth. Uh, I think it's it's very impressive the work you do because it's super holistic or you're really trying very hard to, to reach different groups and, and uh, use them uh, proactively for your city development. Uh, we have uh, a question here or two questions who actually are quite aligned. So, and I think many people really wonder when you say you try to listen to the, the, the more silent and find the ones who are more invisible, uh, have, do you feel that you've succeeded there or has that been a, 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 a challenge throughout? And, and can you tell a bit more about your work to, to reach these people who are a bit more marginalized? Yes, I think uh, we, we have just started, right? There are so many people who are not maybe uh, used to taking part or being heard. So I have been, uh, we have had focused uh, groups in the prison. Mm -hmm. We have had to uh, apply for half a year in advance just to enter a yoga hour in the prison. Or we, we actually had to start two years before starting the yoga class. And that was our way into the prison. Mm -hmm. um, we also got a question from, uh, from a teacher uh, giving classes to people with no formal education. Uh, coming to Arendal with no, uh, you know, uh, diplomas or no schools. They actually can hardly write, but uh, some of them can read. And I think I met myself a little bit there because I was thinking, what can they do in this municipal plan? What do they knew about, know about the, the UN goals? And I was ashamed of myself because we then had to provide a specific a way of working with them. We asked the guides, you know, and translators from these languages that knew the people who came some years ago and could relate to the people and, and their background. And we worked throughout some weeks and explained about this digital meeting and they could provide pictures from a place they wanted to change. And we also wrote down for them into the digital meeting, what the statement uh, were and, and what they wanted. And the, the third example would be to, we contacted people, you know, the organization of blind, people who cannot see uh, or disabled. And, and uh, so you really have to think, uh, and you can never stop, I mean, because then it's elderly women with refugee background. So it's just to say that if, if you sit down and think, who do I forget here? Uh, can they walk? Can they see? Can they talk? Can they hear? And, and, and can they share? And are they safe? That made these different approaches. So we have had several uh, meetings and projects going on to kind of collect the, the opinions of of people who feel in, invisible or, or maybe are silent. 
All right, thank you so much for uh, elaborating a little bit more about that. You also mentioned earlier to me that you actually just got new funding with another million Norwegian crowns for your work moving forward. So congratulations to that. I think a lot of people might sit here now and wonder how do you finance all this and, and, and to have all these meetings. But I guess one of the tricks is to use a lot of uh, voluntary organizations as well, right, in your work. Yes. Uh, but of course, you also managed to, to, to uh, rebuild a, a, a whole building into a cultural house for, for, for activities for, for youth and everything. So it takes some resources uh, as well. So you have to get the politicians to, to invest. Yes, uh, and also we have a systematic way of working with helping people to be very good at uh, uh, applying for funding. Uh, so I think I, we get millions a year uh, to small and bigger projects. That's very clever. Thank you so much, Lisbeth. Very, very interesting. And uh, to all of you who are listening, just uh, contact Lisbeth afterwards as well. We will share all the presentations and the recording of, of today's session with you uh, via email afterwards as well, and the contact information. All right, one more Menti before yes, we uh, very continue. Quick one. And I see that there's an additional question that actually it's uh, aligns a little bit with uh, what we're about to ask you if we don't have the time to address all of the questions, um, we will make sure to write back to you um, in person after the webinar. So uh, not to be um, cynics, but <laughs> we uh, are wondering whether you've experienced the efforts on gender equality, LGBTQ and our youth inclusion as tokenism, uh, which is to say that it's good to have, but not essential. Yeah, how do you feel about this? Does it does it still happen, or is it nowadays more unusual? Looks like sometimes is the big answer. It still happens. Yes, and for those of you who uh, perhaps joined the webinar a bit later, um, feel free to jump in using the code one seven eight nine two six six at menti.com, and then you can also answer all of the. Uh, questions that we're asking during the webinar. Yes. But without much further ado, uh, we can right. see that, uh, yeah, it does happen. It's uh, so um, we will have to strengthen our work. <laughs> yeah, work even harder on that and making sure it, it becomes essential. This leads us over to our next uh, keynote speaker from uh, Swedish gender champion municipality, Umeå. Uh, we have with us today Linda Gustafsson, and you're the gender equality officer in Umeå. And I know that you, you just released a book last year of about the 30 years of gender equality work in Umeå, but you've been working on this even longer. So, uh, and of course, adding a broader uh, agenda of inclusion to, to your work as well. So Linda, we're so happy to have you here today and just very welcome to, to share your, your learnings and experiences of your work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, my name is Linda Gustafsson. I work as a gender equality officer for the city of Umeå. I also coordinate Umeå's work on the Commission on Social Sustainability. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the the holistic approach that we're trying to have when it comes to gender equality and also the work connected to the SDGs. So next slide, please. Um, the city of Umeå has a long-term goal for the entire municipality, which is that Umeå should grow in a sustainable way, uh, meaning all aspects of sustainability. So that's very much in line also with the SDGs. And we have a long-term goal from the city council to create conditions for women and men to have equal power to shape society as well as their own lives. And uh, this is one of then, uh, I think now three long term goals for the for, from the city council of Umeå that affects all the committees of the municipality and also the departments of the city. And I will also like to say that I think that one of the key factors in Umeå's work with gender equality is that gender equality is seen as a tool for development. Um, it's something that we work with to make sure that all our, our other efforts uh, reach their goals. Uh, it's a way of developing the city, making sure that it's a place where people want to live and have the 
possibility for well-being and so on. And uh, we've been working for a long time with gender equality. There's also a gender equality committee with politicians from the city council uh, that's been in place since 1994. Someone like me working strategically with gender equality issues uh, for the municipality has been in place since 1989. So it's a long history. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you just heard, we released a book just this fall, uh, and there's a link to it in the bottom of the slide called Gender, Power and Politics, uh, looking back at 30 years of working with gender equality with examples from different departments of the city and how they have worked with gender equality trying to share knowledge from different parts of the municipality. Uh, it's also a way of trying to, because one, um, one thing that is sometimes present in work with gender equality is that experience and knowledge get lost. Uh, and to make sure the book was one, one way of making sure that this knowledge stays in the, in the uh, municipality and also can be shared. Um, and also I wanted to share with you some aspects of the work with gender equality in Umeå that has been highlighted by others, national agencies and so on, why it's been uh, successful in the way that it's been present for a very long time and on the agenda and that we have results from our work with gender equality that has a lot to do with just keeping it dedicated, keeping it strategic, keeping it funded, uh, also things that we heard from Arendal just, just now and also the development oriented work. Next slide, please. I also wanted to share this with you because I think that one of the key, key points in our work with gender equality is also the sharing of knowledge, uh, sharing our knowledge and uh, being very appreciative of others who share their knowledge with us, uh, being part of networks on local and regional and national and international level. We heard about the CMR. Um, which Umu signed the declaration in 2008, and we have cooperation with them. We've been involved in projects from Nick as well. Uh, and right now we're leading a project uh, within the URBAC program of the European Commission on sustainable urban development, uh, their first project on gender equality, uh, which Umu leads and there are six other partners. And I think this also with the SDGs, uh, we talk about gender equality work in this project as globally understood but locally contextualized that you need to understand gender equality and can understand gender equality as a as a global issue, uh, but you need to contextualize it locally. For us in Umeå, it's about looking at what sort of city is Umeå, what challenges are we facing? Um, how much money do our inhabitants have? How do they travel to and from work? What is the situation when it comes to violence against women in Umeå and so on? So really contextualizing it to make sure that we get um, suggestions or solutions or sort of attacking the problem from the right point of view. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give you two more concrete examples also on how we try to integrate the work with the SDGs and different SDGs. So this is, I would then say the first, uh, reducing poverty, but also working with gender equality. So this is the work that UMU is doing on reducing child poverty, where we have highlighted, or we have seen that when it comes to reducing child poverty in UMU, we need to address uh, the difficulties that, that women who are not born in Sweden uh, and that have a lower uh, level of education phase when it comes to entering the labor market. Because we know that the children of these women, especially if they are single uh, parents, um, that they are in risk of uh, living in, in poverty. Um, and one example of how we work with that is through our adult education, which in Sweden is called SFE, where you go to learn Swedish. It's called Swedish for Immigrants. And they have for many years increased knowledge and, and working towards maybe changing attitudes around gender equality to their students, and also very much highlighting the importance just of gender equality as a topic that they work with just as uh, mathematics or Swedish or the other ones that you can see right there. So uh, being just uh, targeting different groups as we also heard from Arendal, 
seeing that when it comes to reducing child poverty, for example, we need to address certain groups to get the right sort of keys to that problem and then working with gender equality as a way of reducing child poverty. Next slide, please. And this is another uh, example of a project. So this is uh, what we call, um, this is called free zone. And this is, uh, this is just a way of showing also how we work with the goal on gender equality, but also in the SDGs, uh, the goal number 11 on sustainable cities and I think communities. Um, so this is also, just also to go back to the presentation from Arendal, to find the unseen or the voices that are not normally heard. Um, this is a, up in the right side of the slide, you can see this tree and this is a part of a very central uh, area, central park in Umeå. And it was to be um, designed in some way. And we chose to work with something that we called inclusion through exclusion, meaning that we excluded a lot of groups from the discussion or from the dialogue uh, of the, this part of the park to be able to include the group of young girls, because we could see that young girls are young people uh, but also specifically maybe young girls are not very much involved in city dialogues or dialogues on the design of public spaces. So we wanted to, be, to have this specific dialogue with them. Uh, in the left corner, right, you can see uh, some of the girls, but not all of the girls. We wanted to have, a, of course, a diversity within, with, among the girls as well. So. We had girls that did not have Swedish, for example, as their first language and young, young girls that were both comfortable in public space and those who weren't. Um, and just instead of asking them, what is it that you want in, in a public space? We ask them about uh, what is it like to be a young girl and what is it like to be a young girl in Umeå? And we got answers that very much pointed towards that and you can see also they're doing dance. We used a lot of artistic workshops in this project, dance, photography, uh, screen printing and so on to talk about what it's like to be a young girl. And what they told us very much was that there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of expectations in being a 17 year old girl in Umeå or in maybe anywhere in the world. Uh, and what they wanted was a free zone. They wanted a space where they were expected to do nothing, where they could just hang out and be by themselves or together with friends, a place that was for everyone in the city. This is a public park, but a place where they would feel comfortable being and hanging out and not be afraid that someone would ask them to leave or that they were not supposed to be there and a place that they didn't have to pay for. Uh, so next slide, please. This is what it looks like now. Um, so we try to, of course, we cannot create a space free from expectation, but we can create something where they feel like they have the right to be and to exist and hang out. So we used, we worked a lot with the lighting and we worked with the swings and trying to design it also so that it fits girls that are 165 centimeters long and you can listen to music and other things like that but just a very practical example on what happens also with the public space when we listen to other groups and we normally listen to and when we use other methods than we usually use and I think there's also this holistic approach not only between the different SDGs but also within the SDG 5 it's also talking about urban planning and public spaces. Uh, it's, yes, we have discussions about violence uh, in public space, but there's also discussions about dialogue. There's also, also expectant, uh, discussions about expectations and what it's like being a young girl and just integrating all of those discussion into a specific place, I think is also really important to do to not just focus on one part of gender equality when you work in a project like this. Mm -hmm. So next slide, please. My last slide. I just wanted to show you this because just as I said, this holistic work, because of course we work also with violence against women um, with a campaign with our regional authorities, which it's called Brydepunkt nu in Swedish, which is care. 
uh, and then also our piece of art in the uh, town square of Umeå, which is this very red, it's called Listen. Uh, and it's, as far as we know, it's the first municipal commissioned artwork dedicated to the Me Too movement. Uh, so when we're all allowed to travel again, I hope you will come to Umeå and look at it because it's, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, it looks very, very powerful and empowering, yes. I think. Yes. Thank you uh, so much. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for, for sharing uh, these uh, views and uh, very sort of constructive, uh, innovative ideas on how to reach the ones who are not the easiest to reach and involve them. What would you would you like to mention also if you, and by the way, if you have questions, uh, dear audience, just uh, please put them in the chat. And meanwhile, we don't have that much time, but I was just curious, do you have any other specific or concrete uh, results that you want to highlight? I mean, I also heard that you have the highest rate of paternity leave, for example, among men. Men in Umeå are the best ones at taking care mm -hmm. of their children, obviously. Uh, are there any other uh, examples you'd like to give of results of this dedicated uh, long-term work that you've done? Well, I think uh, one of the, oh, just a very like statistic like that is, for example, we have a very even distribution of young people when it comes to sports. For example, there are exactly as many girls as boys that play football or, but also, as you said, the parental leave. And that's also for a long time, the municipality has sent out cards to all its male employees that uh, uh, have uh, newborn babies to remind them to take out their parental leave. Uh, and we have a lot of private industries and private companies that do that as well, just uh, making sure that they take out their parental leave. But the sports also uh, is one example. Uh, so I think that there are, there, are, there are a number of those concrete results as well. Although yeah. everything can go, everything goes back and forth all the time, but <laughs> yeah, there are some. And you are also for people to understand, how do you connect your work to the SDG monitoring? Do you, are you in charge also as a coordinator for the gender work to also see, I mean, when it comes to reporting on your different SDGs and monitoring progress, do you also work on that? Or do you collaborate with, with the local statistics office? Or yes, yes, or? there's a collaboration between our statistics and some other people that are involved in that work as well. Hmm. So if people want to know more about that, they can also contact They can you contact and me and I will, yes. Because yes. you seem to have done a lot of work to, to integrate the different SDGs as well in, in your different uh, measures here. All right. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, uh, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, all right. Time for another Melty question before Indeed. we go to Iceland. Yes. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, and so the question we pose is as a participant in this webinar with which gender do you identify and we are interested in this uh, mainly for two reasons just to see actually uh, who are we reaching uh, from a very practical perspective uh, based on the genders mm. um, and yeah basically what 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 do we need to um, do to kind of get that figure to be 50 50 perhaps or exactly and I think this is one of the big remaining challenges um, as we heard from our previous speakers there are quite a few things happening in order to engage more men in work with gender equality, but also inclusion overall. Uh, but I do think it's still a little bit of a challenge that, that the topic itself attracts uh, way more women than men. So I think this is also, of course, something to ponder for all of us. And if you have examples from your own work on how you engage with men, whether it's young men, whether it's the fathers, as in the case of Umeå, or, uh, or yeah, any target audience uh, of men, uh, just uh, share some links uh, and ideas in the chat. And I am assured that the distribution that we see here is not representative for all of the ongoing gender work that we do in the Nordic countries. No, probably not, probably not. But it's usually this distribution that we see in, the, in these kind of webinars. And we've also, of course, failed with having male speakers today. And we have to admit to that as well. 
Uh, so uh, now let's turn to our third and last keynote uh, for the day. And uh, we're going to fly over to Iceland and the Koppa Vågur uh, municipality. Uh, and you are champions on youth inclusion. Uh, so we're going to listen to Anna Elisabeth Olafsdottir, and you're a public health specialist, uh, together with Sigrun Maria Kristinsdottir, project manager of public participatory democracy in Koppa Vågur municipality. Uh, and I know you're working in a very dedicated and systematic way to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that's, of course, one of the big issues when it comes to inclusion as well. And you're turning your city into a child-friendly city. And uh, the question is, of course, how can this impact and influence the municipality's affair? How can, we in, how can you include youth and children in, in the development of your city? So we're happy to have you here. Very welcome. Please, Anna Elisabeth and Sigrun Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, let me find the slides. Share. And slideshow. Do we have it as we want to have it? Uh, please use the full screen mode if you can, so we can split. Play setting. Where did you do it? Uh, is it uh, yeah. Is it here or? Yeah, swap presenter. Yeah. You can see, yeah, yes. swap. Yes. Right there. Uh -huh. yes. That's good. Always learning something new. <laughs> uh, let me move you here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing us to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. It has been so informative so far. Uh, uh, we are going to present together, uh, Sirun, Maria, and me. I will start and she will take uh, the, the last slide. Uh, but uh, we are going to present uh, a one, one project, which is, uh, like Ors said, related to the, uh, to the Convention on the Right of a Child. So, uh, uh, and it is, of course, linked to the implementation of the Social Development Goals, which Copa World is also implementing. Uh, so uh, uh, since 2013, the, the Convention on the Right of the Child or UNCRC uh, has been part of uh, Icelandic law and uh, several uh, cities or municipalities in Iceland are now implementing uh, the, the UNCRC into the uh, municipalities work and in order to become a child-friendly city, which is a UNICEF, international UNICEF project. And actually, Akureyri was the first one in Iceland, and Kopovoer is now the second one, and uh, we have already submitted our final report to UNICEF, so we expect to, to uh, become a child-friendly city within a few weeks or months. Uh, there are these four core elements of the UNCRC, uh, uh, yes, and it is uh, the, the article number two, which is no discrimination between children, regardless of their background or status. We always do the best uh, for the children, the best interest of a child. And number six, we emphasize uh, 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 making li a good life for children for their survival and development. And then uh, it's the last one, uh, Article 12, which is about respecting uh, the children's view. And this is uh, the article we are working on in this project. Uh, and it's, of course, also related to the fifth and the tenth uh, SDGs, which is the focus on our meeting here today. Uh, our working procedures, uh, we cooperated with two uh, out of nine schools in our municipality. And by the way, uh, the size of Copa Vogel municipality is it's almost 40,000 uh, citizens. It's the second biggest municipality in Iceland. 
but although we are the second biggest, we are probably very small compared to several communities in, in, in Europe, even in the Nordic countries. Uh, we had eight groups uh, of five to six children in every group. Uh, and of these eight groups, two groups were children of foreign origin. And the participants were from uh, nine to 15 years of age. And the children were asked two questions, which they considered individually. And then they discussed these questions in groups. And these questions were, how can children participate in decision-making within the municipality? And number two, how can their participation become a routine in the municipality work? And uh, we are here working with children of this age from nine to 15, uh, because we, although we have a youth council in the city, it tends to be a bit older uh, children or youth in this uh, youth council. And the voice of these younger children uh, is maybe what Lisbeth called it uh, just before, one of the silent voices. We don't hear them. So here we are trying to, to reach to these younger children. And, and in the future, we would even like to reach younger children. Uh, the groups delivered the results after discussion and the discussions were facilitated either by a staff member in that particular school or the oldest child in the school. Uh, that was also sometimes the case. Uh, then uh, we decided to have private interviews with disabled children and uh, in times of COVID we got uh, two children to, to, to meet with and have discussion on. Uh, one uh, is physically disabled and the other one is with autism and the parent was present and one of the staff member, either me or Sigrun, we took notes. And uh, these are were well, the children's ideas. They mentioned social media to communicate and maybe also to undertake surveys and or opinion polls. Uh, they mentioned, and I think this is one of the most important things, to use youth centers better. And youth centers are connected to the school. So after school, they, many children go there, not all. And uh, they would like to use uh, this opportunity to have these uh, discussions and make conclusions that they can communicate to the municip municipality council. They also mentioned idea boxes so they can, can submit nameless uh, ideas and that can be collected and sent to the municipality. They uh, told us that uh, regular meetings at school uh, would be good and then uh, the children go to the municipality council to uh, uh, present what they have been discussing. They also thought it would be nice to make it possible for children to send emails or SMS with their suggestions to the municipality council. And then the student really would like to send representatives to meet the mayor uh, after school discussions. So uh, these were the, their ideas. Uh, just to mention the comments from the uh, private discussions we had with the two, these two, chil two children, uh, the child with the physical that was physically disabled and is in a wheelchair, uh, this is what it mentioned as a, a problem for it uh, in their normal life. It's the access. Uh, access often hinders the child to live a normal life. It's how the school is building is planned. For example, location of toilets. It's far away from the other toilets. Uh, also the facilities, the sinks are high, the doors are heavy, they can't open it without help. It's also the understanding of their situation and uh, the child took as an example, it has got a late uh, because it took so long time to go between classrooms. And then finally gatherings, uh, sometimes the assignments require the children to be uh, physically active. So sometimes uh, this child is just told to go and do something else. 
but it really, really would like to participate in the gatherings. Uh, and comments from a child with autism, uh, that is much more uh, focused on noise. So sometimes this child says the noise in, in, at school is unbearable. It's similar with the outdoor activities and it doesn't always feel secure there. Uh, it's also facilities and that uh, replies or refers to having no quiet spaces. So when the child uh, sometimes has to leave their classroom because it cannot stay in there any, any longer, it only has the corridor. And there we have maybe classes going out for outdoor activities or whatever. So it's uh, uh, difficult for this child. It's the understanding. And sometimes it has happened, it took us an example, it has to uh, leave class because it, it cannot stay in there any longer because of the noise. And then it gets, gets absence from, from class. And finally, this child also mentioned sport, uh, that this can be uh, challenges for it. So uh, uh, we have been trying to listen to all voices, uh, also uh, these, uh, those voices that we don't always hear. So uh, I will just jump into the uh, implementation. Yeah, I'm afraid we're running out of time a little bit. So just go okay. into it's, the It's yeah. only this slide and one more, and then oh, Siru perfect. Maria will take over. So uh, okay. it's this only six steps. So I will not go into this here, just saying in the first step is the training of staff, because staff must know how, how to uh, listen to children and listen to the words that they don't say even. Mm. Uh, the discussions within schools that should be twice uh, a year, once each semester, then we have once a year the children's conference, uh, then we would like to open for comments for the results from the children's com uh, uh, conference, because many children, especially those from of foreign origin, uh, mentioned it would be easier to write down the comments rather than speak them out. Mm. And then uh, representatives will meet the municipality council and then the municipality can uh, take actions uh, and fulfill their, uh, their, their wishes as uh, must, much as possible. So, mm. uh, Siru Maria, if you take over here, the challenges. Thank you. Um... Yes, um, I'll be I'll be quick if we're running out of time. But uh, um, we were actually yes, so we have time for some questions as well. If there are okay. Questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, we focused on social equity rather than gender equality, um, but we did have a gender issue there. We had a difficult time finding enough boys to participate in the uh, the the question groups, and uh, which may have some like it, it may resonate with uh, the problems that we have in this webinar here mm -hmm. um the boys are not so interested in in uh, in this in iceland at the moment um we also will later have to find out ways to reach uh, younger children with the older children we rely a little bit on the youth council um and uh Perhaps the most kind of uh, foreseeable challenge was to include both the uh, disabled and the, the children of immigrants, which we then set out specifically to, to search for and, and include them. However, it is a little bit uh, questionable whether we will actually always um, take uh, them separate from the others. Um, the immigrants may be a little bit more easier because they're, um, we can access them more easily through the schools. Um, but the disabled children may be more difficult to include in, 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 um, in uh, work like um, Anna Elisabeth posted there for you um, because they have those challenges. So we have to uh, put special um, effort into taking them in without separating them as a special group. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I, I'm really curious also to hear uh, what what other results came up from this. I think it sounded like a long list of, of measures for the schools uh, to, to cater to the needs of these children with somewhat special needs of different kinds. But would you give any other examples of what the children uh, wished for or the ideas that they had uh, in terms of the city development for them? The the 
children's conference that um, Anna had kind of rushed over a little bit is, is kind of the main outcome out of this, where we will use um, some processes that are already in place in the schools um, to involve the children, um, focus on things that they want to be addressed or that they are noticing, mm -hmm. um, and then bring that to the, the uh, um, city council. Okay, we, and you could have this conference uh, in the spring, like when, when COVID has passed or something. <laughs> we are planning on it, yes. And we are we are planning, um, not mentioned here, but as a part of a, a, a bigger, of the implementing the, um, the, the uh, convention. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, a course for uh, teachers and staff members of schools and youth centers to um, part, help with making this conference become uh, true. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have uh, other ways to get allow the children to communicate with um, the municipality or authorities without the intervention of um, the parents. Right, and Can, that was the ideas from the children, right, about SMSs or just yeah. other ways, social media channels where they could post their ideas directly to the city council. Yes, okay. and, so, and also, do you see that there has been a good engagement from the children. Were they involved so far in this? I would like to add just to what, uh, what uh, because uh, uh, one of the things we have done and I've, I'm very uh, proud of is that, uh, you know, the kids in, in school, uh, they get iPad from our municipality mm. uh, from nine years and upwards. And uh, we have, for example, during this work, uh, we are going to, we have already put a icon on their iPad so they can uh, inform us if they are worried about any violence against themselves or uh, their friends uh, and it goes straight to, into our system and the children will be connected and we are going to put another icon on this their iPad so they can send in uh, their suggestions for improvements in the in the community. That sounds Sorry. super clever. So that's a very uh, easy to use tool then for the kids. Uh, it is, and, and, and right. the, the icon for the uh, children's services is um, already uh, more used than we uh, expected, which is both good and, and sad that they need to use it. Well, that sounds very good. And then you also added the gender aspects and you touched upon that. I thought it was interesting that you had a problem engaging men, while in Arendal and Umeå it seemed like there were more girls that had felt yeah. marginalized and outside of the process. So maybe you can also discuss this together <laughs> a little bit to see what, you know, the context, what, what differs uh, in your different communities. Thank you so much uh, for participating. And again, for all of you in the audience, just, you know, connect with all our fabulous speakers here today. And now, last but not least, I want to introduce Anne-Sophie Anne Backgren from uh, Österbotten in Finland because uh, you are uh, chairing the gender equality group uh, in Österbotten region, uh, promoting gender equality in all the municipalities in your region. And you want to be the first region in Finland where all municipalities have actually signed on to the European Convention on Gender Equality, the CIMER uh, Convention or uh, charter for gender equality that we mentioned earlier. So Anne-Sophie, it's good to have you on board. Please tell us a little bit more about your, your work because you've just sort of started and you have several ideas. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, yes, I'm the chairwoman on the gender committee at the Regional Council of Ostrobotnia. And it means that I'm sitting on the opposite side of, of Linda, on the opposite side of Umeå and Westerbotten. There you can find the region of Ostrobotnia and the city of Vasa and the, 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 the whole region. We have 14 municipalities. And uh, some years ago, we decided, as you said, that we will be the first region in Finland that where all the municipalities have signed this European charter of, of um, equality uh, between women and men at the local level. Mm. And I have to admit that I thought it, this, this will be quite a fast, uh, fast work and it will be no problem if I say so. But I realized it's, it's a longer process. 
with the municipality. So we really have to, to plan the work and, and so to, to, to formalize this gender work with the municipality, gender equality work with the municipalities. So we arranged a lot of seminars, webinars, whatever, and we also took inspiration from Umeå and Linda. She also visited us in Vasa and the region, and, and we got some inspiration from her and, and, and the work that, that, that they have done in Umeå. And also together with uh, with other other uh, stakeholders, mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, then we we uh, we realized that we really have to to formalize this work, as I said. So mm -hmm. so we, we started to educate with especially the municipality level. We we founded a kind of network. Uh, so in every every municipality there is a, a person contact person that really has to be educated in a in a more efficient efficient may perhaps and then also the uh, this contact first had to to create or local groups in the municipality that we can also start to 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 educate them mm. this is a work that we have been done now and at the moment we we are not in in, in uh, we have some, some still some municipalities, but 11 or 14 municipalities have signed the charter, so three left. So now well, we will- That's not a lot. That's, not a, so, that's we, a good so result. This, so this spring we will, I will hope, and then we come to the, to, the, to, to the end of this spring that all the municipalities in, in the Ostrobotnia region has signed this European charter. And then we will build the first first in Finland, and that was our goal, because we really wanted to, to make a statement, if I say so. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, 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 the region, we have quite uh, uh, gender segregated, segregated, segregated label market. Mm -hmm. We have a, a lot of uh, companies, uh, businesses in the technology center uh, uh, sector. Uh, we have ABB, Wärtsilä Diesel, uh, and, and also big big export, so it's a lot of engineers, if I say mm -hmm. so. And then we really like uh, notice that now we have to do something. So 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 last year we started to to work more with this uh, gender segregated labor market, and and now this uh, week really at Monday we launched a campaign, mm -hmm. and and uh, we will now. We will now award the uh, equality company of the year in the business sector. So this campaign just launched uh, last Monday or this Monday, and now it's uh, months ahead uh, that where people can nominate mm -hmm. uh, uh, companies that have been uh, done something good, good examples of really taking into account this gender gender thinking if i said so in the business life and then we will uh, in march la uh, celebrate and, and really give the first prize in ostrobotnia region we think that it, we will hope and we also hope that it, this will make a, a good good example for other businesses also or companies to, to work more with the, the the, so the that is that is one of the main challenges, obviously, then that you have you have discovered in the region. It's the gender yes. segregated labor market. I also know that you worked uh, quite strategically with the schools, with yes. the high schools, and with the high school teachers' education yes. at all yes. the university, right? So you're also creating a module for gender equality uh, education. So 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 you you will enlighten the younger generation uh, further on the yes. issue. Yes, because when we had this this seminar of, and realized that we really had this gender segregated labor market, we, we also started to have round tables. We mm. had round tables with the municipality level, but also with the business sector and organ, business organization, but also especially with the educational sector and the study super, supervisors, because they are an important part of how what are they saying to the low, to the youngsters when they are trying mm. to get out of, of and, and and applying for gymnasium or vocational school or whatever oh, yeah. so and, to and now, their, their choices of, of work for the future yeah. and now we have a pilot together with the because in in Vasa we have also the high school where we educate master uh, the master level teachers mm -hmm. So right. we have a so we educate teachers at the master level and together with the, the Obo Academy we have a pilot now that how to implement more gender issues in the new curriculum at the gymnasium level and then we after that we go on to the vocational level. 
Thank you so much. I think this is very uh, inspirational and important. And we, of course, we wanted to invite you today also to really point out the important role of the regional level in support of the municipalities within their regions. And, and uh, as you said, you, you're working both on specific projects and issues, but also through the network you created, you have now a, a systematic or, or a continuous uh, exchange of, of ideas and experiences, uh, I, I understand, between the municipalities, which I think is also crucial for success. Uh, thank you so much and best of luck with everything. Uh, and keep us posted when all your municipalities are uh, signed up to the convention. Thank I will, you thank much. you. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, this leaves us with very few minutes uh, to wrap up. Do we do the final mentees? We need to look at the results uh, on our final mentee questions before we wrap up today. I realize that the formal time has run out, but for those of you who are um, able to stick around, why don't we just run through them? Yeah, yeah, we just run through the, the, the answers uh, to the mentee questions, because I've seen that you've answered as we've moved along here uh, with the webinar. Uh, right. So yeah. Yes, and the time. last uh, the last two questions uh, we had was to um, uh, uh, to see uh, what type of stakeholders do you um, work with, and um, I guess our answers are reflective of the uh, work of our um, amongst the member of our audience today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so um, Sophie pointed a lot to the private sector here, but, uh, but you clearly work primarily with partners within the public sector, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure is also useful, useful, but then we have the NGOs and the youth organizations, other organizations as a very important partner as well. Uh, again, thank you for contributing. And the final question now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is... Uh... How can we reach the SDG 5 and 10 goals 10 years from now? Uh, just a very um, reflective um, way to wrap up. So please share your um, uh, what comes to mind. Yes, what's your primary success factor? Can you formulate it in one word? Maybe this is just too hard. It's a very complex process that you're working on, and we know that. But if you want to, ah, wow, this probably sums it up really nicely. Yes, we have to definitely work on that. And maybe uh, also, or, or we're encouraging all of you to, to apply for, for projects with Nick and the, the Nordic Gender Equality Fund towards this goal. Um, yes. And I think that while the uh, nature of uh, work at the, the local level and amongst the municipality are, you know, pertains to the public sector um, work when the presenter talked about how we use the built environment to also um, implement these projects speaks to the need for engaging private sector stakeholders, public private partnerships, and not least to address other um, important issues. Uh, we know the role of the media when it mm -hmm. comes to certain uh, gender equality um, problems yes. uh, in the Nordics. Yeah, so there are lots of, of partners to, to reach out to here to, to promote the agenda. All right, more things coming in. Leadership, trust building, but participation is definitely the leading word. And I think all of our speakers today have really uh, emphasized that as well and uh, showed how they worked hard to increase participation also of the more uh, or sometimes more marginalized groups. So we hope you feel inspired and we hope that you wanna come back in two weeks and tune in again for a fourth Zoom webinar in our series about localizing the Agenda 2030. And the topic on the 27th of January will be sustainable consumption and production, because that's actually one of the SDGs where the Nordic countries are not doing so well, uh, or at least we could do much more. Uh, so stay tuned or tune in again, I mean, for the 27th of January to that webinar. And then there are two more coming up in February as well on planning for sustainable cities. And last but not least, monitoring and evaluating your SDG progress. So uh, 
Welcome back, and we hope you enjoyed the webinar today and stay in touch. All the best. Bye-bye.